Okay, we are finally gonna do that room tour that I talked about a few weeks ago. I posted on the community tab. Most of you guys wanted to see it. I've never done a reptile room tour, even though I've been on YouTube for several years. It's just something that I've not done. So we are gonna go through each of these enclosures. But before we do that, why am I holding a microphone like some kind of strange news reporter? Well. I already recorded this video. I recorded it this morning. It took like two hours to do. And when I started editing it, I just could not handle the audio quality. I have this really cheap, just lavalier mic that sits on top of your collar. And I just hate the way it sounds. Okay, so we're finally getting to that room tour that I- No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Of course, now that I do the podcast, audio quality is something that I focus on every single week when I'm editing the show, and I just could not handle editing that video and giving this tinny, bad quality audio. So anyway, I'm gonna stand here with my actual podcasting equipment like some kind of strange news reporter while I go through this. Luckily, you're not gonna be seeing most of this, but if you do see me looking like this, that is why hopefully it's worth it. Hopefully the audio quality sounds better than it would if I wasn't using this. I don't have any special recording equipment. I just use my iPhone for everything, so... We're gonna make do. All right, so here are the six enclosures in this reptile room that I've jammed into relatively small space. Of course, we are gonna break down each of those enclosures. But before we do, I wanna just run through what I do in this room to maintain the climate. So I use three main pieces of equipment in order to control the climate in this room. The first is this humidifier that I have on the floor. It's off right now, but it does typically run all the way from December into June. That's when it's really dry here where I live. And right now you can see it's holding the room at around 38%. Normally I can get it up to roughly 40. It's been off for a few minutes. But in the winter months, like January, February, the apartment relative humidity is down to 7%, 8%. So this thing does have to be on full blast. And of course, the door needs to be shut at all times. I heat the room with a baseboard heater. That's just the thermostat there, which of course contributes to drying out the air. So because the air dries out so much in the winter months, I use this guy right here. And this is a swamp cooler. So a swamp cooler is almost like a humidifier. It really is supposed to act as a cooler, but in this room, it really acts more like a humidifier. It just has a giant reservoir of water at this bit at the base, and then a big fan inside behind that grill. And there's a water pump that runs water over top these cardboard walls. Once you turn it on, it blasts very, very humid air into the room. And hopefully I'm cutting in a clip right now of me turning it on in the early morning. You can see how quickly it boosts the humidity from you know 40% up to 60%. 65% or so. Of course, it doesn't last that long. It lasts for an hour or so and slowly drops down during the day. But of course, that's no problem. I usually run it in the morning as well as late at night. Now, I cannot run it during the day. For one, it's really loud and it does make everything quite humid. But because of all the heating and the lighting and everything that's already on this wall, if I turn that on, it will trip the breaker. So it does need to happen either before the lights turn on or after they turn off. All right, so we are gonna jump into the individual animals here. Before we do, I want you to stick around to the very end because I have a favor to ask you guys. Actually, it's not a favor, but I wanna get you guys involved in the next video and or you can skip to the end, however you wanna do it if you wanna skip the video. And also, I want you to let you know if you do wanna pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater. I do have sweaters available now as well. They are available at animalsathome.ca slash shop. And again, $5 for every item does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And I did want to say we actually crossed the $500 barrier for donations, which was awesome. So that was really cool. So let's jump into the animals. All right, so we're gonna start with the day gecko enclosure right here. One quick thing, a lot of people always ask me where I get these cool tags. Well, I get them from Cloud Forest, which is a guy named Matt. He is the owner and designer, obviously, right there. Check him out. I guess he's got Facebook, but he's also on Instagram as well. That's where I found him. Really cool. I have tags for all my enclosures here. So if it's something that you want uh, to make your reptile room look much more sophisticated as well as professional, then I definitely recommend it. And they're very inexpensive as well. Okay, so on to this enclosure. This is the day gecko enclosure. If you are interested in seeing how I did that, I will link a video. I did this last summer. So as you can see, the plants in this enclosure are really becoming overgrown. I really should take some time and prune them up a little bit. They're starting to press up against the screen, so that will be my next job. So as far as plants go, I have a couple of bromeliads that are sort of starting to suffer. There's one right there. Uh, obviously, I have this golden pothos that has absolutely taken off like crazy. I mean, look at the size of these leaves. You can't really tell on the camera, but those are 
bigger than the palm of my hand, those leaves right there. They obviously really love that jungle dawn light. And if you did listen to the podcast last week, we talked about how pothos is potentially a toxic plant. Well, I shouldn't say it's potentially toxic. It is toxic, but it potentially could cause harm to your reptiles. And I know many of us do use it, so it's something you want to consider. If you remember when I did this enclosure, I had umbrella plants as well through the back. Those kind of died. They, I probably pruned them a little bit too aggressively and they died. So I pulled them out and I replaced it with this hibiscus, which has been doing fantastic. And it's bloomed a couple times in the enclosure, which has been, which has been uh, really cool. I don't think I said, but this is a Zilla screen enclosure that I did convert to accompany a bunch of substrate at the bottom. We have a whole bunch of leaf litter down there, dwarf white isopods, powder blue isopods, and of course springtails as well. And there's some garden millipedes that made their way in there. Those are kind of annoying and a little bit unsightly, but they are actually really good cleanup crews. So the only thing is sometimes you have to control our population by pulling the individuals out or they can take over. So as far as equipment goes on this enclosure, we have a halogen bulb, we have a T5 6% UVB bulb from Arcadia, and then we have the 34 watt LED bar or the Jungle Dawn LED bar as well. So that is what runs all of the light in this enclosure. Actually, I forgot a bulb. Right here is the Philips Hue bulb, and that bulb serves almost no purpose except for it simulates a sunrise and sunset. So if you watch the build, well actually maybe I'll show you a clip of it right now. That bulb comes on first and it fades in in the morning and then fades out at night. So it sort of bookends the lighting on the day and it just makes a really cool sunset sunrise effect. We also have a fogger which you can't really see down there but it is there as well as the mister in this little tower. So the mister and the fogger go off a couple of times a day and then I have a dripping system right here as well. The dripper is just there just because I like to have access to fresh water at all times. And of course, now that it is so overgrown, it's really tough to find the gecko in here. I, I know where she is. I can see her, but you guys won't be able to see her. So I will add some video of her. She will eventually come up here to bask under her halogen. So as far as diet goes, I feed her a lot of the Arcadia products, Sticky Foot Gold and Insecti Gold, and the Earth Pro A supplement is great, as well as these two treats, Repti Gold and Insecti Gold back there. And of course, she does eat feeder insects as well. She likes phoenix worms, super worms, and mealworms. Mealworms and super worms are not great, so I tend to stick with the phoenix worms. She does kind of turn her nose up to crickets and hornworms, unfortunately, but these products are whole food so that she can really live off those. But of course, you want to add insects for enrichment. One thing I'll quickly mention before we move on from this gecko is every time I show videos or pictures of this gecko, I always have the same feedback. Wow, her calcium glands are huge. And yes, they are. Now, some people who own day geckos think Wow, that's a very healthy looking gecko. In my opinion, that is not a healthy gecko. They should not be as large as they are. I got her that way. She came to me as a four-year-old from a breeder and they became they were big once I got her. Maybe they grew a little bit since I've had her, but they were very, very, very large when I bought her. And at the time, I didn't really know. And I am finally convinced that that is strictly due to overfeeding synthetic vitamin D. When you overfeed synthetic vitamin D, the body will metabolize calcium at a much higher rate, and of course that causes her to store more calcium. So you might be asking yourself, how is it possible that she had so much synthetic vitamin D in her diet? Well, before I got her, for the four years that the breeders had her, they only fed her mango superfood rapashi, or whatever that mango brand, or ma mango flavor rapashi is called. And when I got her, I tried to expand her palate a little bit, but she was very, very picky when I first got her. And a big staple from me for her was Pangea Crested Gecko Diet with insects. That has synthetic vitamin D in it. Typically, of course, that's the crested gecko diet. Most crest, I shouldn't say most, but many crested geckos, especially back then, did not have UV and it wasn't a recommendation to have UV for them, meaning synthetic, synthetic vitamin D was necessary. Anyway, long story short, that caused her to over ingest vitamin D and I believe is the reason that she has such large overdeveloped calcium glands, which I do not think is healthy. That's why I recommend the Arcadia products for crested geckos as it does not include synthetic vitamin D. You can include synthetic synthetic vitamin D in your in your day gecko's diet, but it should be done sparingly, maybe once or twice a month. It's not something that needs to be done every single meal. So one really quick thing before we move on, I have recommended in day gecko Facebook groups that we should stop using Pangea and Rapashi or foods that contain synthetic vitamin D, and people really, really didn't like that suggestion. So maybe take it with a grain of salt. I'm of the opinion that it is not a supplement that needs to happen at every single meal. Again, it's something that can happen once or twice a month. 
All right, so on to the next animal, and this is my crested gecko. So this is my first reptile that I ever bought. I bought him in 2007. He was born in 2005, so he's a 15-year-old going on 16-year-old gecko, and I think he was born in 2005. It may have been a year earlier than that. So I've had him for a very long time. He lived through a bunch of bad care on my part as well as the person that had him before me, and he's still hanging in there. It has been quite a while since I've updated this enclosure, so I should do that soon. But of course, it has classic pothos, a bunch of horizontal branches for him to perch and relax on. And I do have some fake plants in the back. That's one of the main reasons I do want to redo this enclosure, because I want to get rid of those fake plants. As far as diet, he does eat the Arcadia foods as well. And I do mix in once in a while vitamin D supplement, but again, not very often, because he does have a T5 Shade Dweller kit from Arcadia, which does give him UV. Now, again, that's one of those areas where people think you don't need UV, but we do recommend UV for all of the reptile species that you keep. And there he is hanging out under the UV right now. Okay, I want to show you guys something really cool. Can you see that lighter patch of skin just behind his arm there? And there's another lighter patch, lighter patch of skin just in front of his knee. Again, it's kind of hard to see. I think you can see that one decently well. Now, that is what happens when he sits under the UV light. The skin that is in direct contact of the UV gets much darker. And this skin, which isn't under the UV, because when he's in his sort of standing position, that skin is kind of tucked in underneath his elbow, and it doesn't see the UV. It stays much, it stays much lighter, which is really, really fascinating. So I forgot to mention that I will be mixing in a few questions that folks on Instagram asked me. And one of the questions was, do you need to change bioactive substrate? And the answer is sort of yes and no. If you set the substrate up right, so if you go maybe to Serpa Design and you look up a DIY vivarium substrate recipe, if you use it properly and you mix in the proper biodegradables, you won't have to replace it. You may have to add, you may have to add leaf litter or some sphagnum moss or some bark and whatnot over time as it starts to break down, but you don't need to fully change it. Now, if you happen to make the mistake that many of us made in the early days, and instead of making a proper mixture of substrates that's going to break down over time, you just use like a coconut core or something, that does need to be pulled out and changed because that will not degrade properly. It doesn't go through a proper soil cycle, and it will build up methane and sulfur, and really it should not be used solely as a substrate. So if that is your substrate right now, it needs to be changed to something that has more components. So the other question I had that went along with that question is, does wood rot in a vivarium? And the answer is basically yes. If you don't want wood to rot, you need to lift it up off the soil. I'm not sure if you can see back there, but I have this sort of stone ceramic bowl that's hidden in the back. The main wood structure of this enclosure is sitting on that because I didn't want it to rot. But if your wood is touching the soil, it will start to decompose just like it would outside. The one thing I don't have on this enclosure is supplemental heat. I would eventually love to add a low wattage halogen bulb or something to allow him to get some near infrared, although it just gets too hot in this room to add any extra heat to this enclosure. As you know, or if you do know, crested geckos are a little bit of a cooler species, so I can't add any extra heat right now. It'll be something I have to do in the future. So on to my boa enclosures. There's the one on the top there, and then there's the one on the bottom. They are identical enclosures. I did them at the same time. Now, the first section there is a four-foot section, and the section on the end is a two-foot section, and they have a tunnel to get into both sections. So it is effectively a six-foot enclosure. Now, these enclosures are at the end of their life. I am getting ready to get rid of them. They probably have a couple more months left. They've kind of served their purpose, but I am definitely ready to move on. As far as heating and lighting goes, we'll start with the heating. So that is a radiant heat panel that I made myself. You can watch that video as well. It is just basically heat cable coiled up in there on top of a foam board with some pegboard and sitting on top or pressing the heat down to a ceramic tile. And there is also some heat tape on the bottom of the enclosure as well. Now, if you know my stuff, if you're familiar with the work that we've been doing on the podcast, you know that I don't recommend non-light emitting heat sources for your main heat. And that's all I have in these enclosures. I would love to add a halogen, but it's just not possible the way these enclosures are set up. I mean, I guess I could have one on the top of this enclosure, and I definitely couldn't have one on the bottom of this enclosure. So it's something that I eventually will change for the upgrade when I do upgrade them. But for now, it is as best as I can get. The heating is controlled by these two thermostats back here. I know you can't really see, but I will link the links in the description. They're decent just on and off thermostats. They do the job just fine. And of course, both enclosures do have an Arcadia Shade Dweller as well. I've had that in there for about a year now, and they seem to be enjoying it. 
So we'll see if we can get a shot of this guy. A little bit of reflection, but that is the Sonoran Desert. Well, he's actually a, a hybrid. He's 50% Sonoran, 50% Colombian boa. Really awesome snake. And then down here is the Colombian boa. She was kind of a rescue. You can sort of see her head. I'll clip in some cool footage of her doing some cryptic basking as well. She'll pretty much always come up on the shelf and bask in the morning. And she likes to bask under her UV as well. Again, a really, really cool snake. So another question I got was, do I have any advice for a first-time boa owner? Well, I my very first snake was a boa as well. That's the Sonoran Desert Boa at the top there. And they are really awesome snakes. They're slow and methodical. They're not sort of crazy, jittery snakes. Typically, they're very well-mannered. And of course, they always are almost always very, very good eaters, which is a bonus. My advice would be if you are interested in them, get one. There's no reason not to get one. They stay a lot smaller than people think. Of course, you can find large mainland boas that get quite big, but if you want something that stays smaller, stay with a Central American boa. Go with a male as well if you want something that gets a bit smaller, but these are not 10, 11, 12 foot snakes like people claim on the internet. Most of them are going to be under eight feet. Most of them are even going to be closer to six feet. So, Figure out what the parents are if you're looking for size because that'll be your best indication. But they're awesome snakes. Don't overfeed them. They are very, very slow growers. Feed them every two, three, four weeks as they get older. You can skip a few meals during the cooler months. And other than that, if you like the snake, get one. All right, so onto the rainbow boa. And guys, my arms are getting so tired between holding this gimbal and this microphone. I'm starting to fatigue here. So most of you should be very familiar with this enclosure. I just posted a video last week or the week before of doing the change. I added a DIY pond, which was really fun. Of course, she's got a halogen bulb now, as well as a computer fan that's controlled by a Wi-Fi plug that comes on every once in a while to simulate some wind and also obviously improve the airflow. I know people were a little bit worried about the humidity, but I can show you uh, the 99% is her humid hide. The 59%, of course, is much too low for a Brazilian rainbow boa, but that is underneath the halogen bulb, so that's very, very much expected. I have another little guy here that's showing 81, which is totally fine. And then this one here is closer to the halogen bulb, but not quite under it, and it's showing 72. And I actually know that this reads a little bit high because I've done a calibration test on this one, and it reads about 5% or yeah, 5% low. So that's probably more like 77%. So if you are looking for how to calibrate humidifiers or hydrometers, just Google calibrate hydrometers. There's a really easy method where you get a cap full of salt and water and put it in a sealed bag and wait for 24 hours. So just Google it, you'll find it and it'll give you an indication of how accurate your hydrometers are. So one thing you might be asking is, hey, where's the warm hide? We did a warm hide in the last video and now it is gone. Well, Turns out I used much too cheap glue for that warm hide and I needed to fix it. So I'll do eventually do an update on this enclosure and I'll go into more detail. But just so you guys know now, I had to redo it because it started to bubble because it was just so humid in this enclosure that the glue started to basically melt away. It was very, very cheap. So I did a new one. It's right here. It's being uh, just drying right now. It's pretty much ready to go back in, but I just want to give it a few more days to fully cure. And the only difference with this one is I used a heavier duty PVA glue. So this is a wood glue that's designed to be outside in the weather. So I think it'll be totally fine. And I also added a layer of dry lock on top as well, just to completely seal it. So that is one mistake I made in that first build. I used way too cheap a glue, but I think this will be totally fine. It looks like it is completely sealed. And as far as equipment goes, we have a strip of LED lights. We have a Arcadia Shade Dweller, and then we also have that 60-watt halogen bulb that's running on this Herpstat EZ1. Of course, that's a proportional thermostat, so it sort of dims and it, or dims or increases the intensity of the bulb as it needs to. And then I also added a heat mat so, or some heat tape under here as well. It's kind of tough to see. I didn't include that in the original build because I didn't have it, but I was talking to some commenters and then it really made me think that I probably should have some sub supplemental heat down there. So that holds the floor temperature around 82%, which works, or sorry, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which works out perfect. And actually the heat tape is on a timer and it runs exactly the same way as it does in my jungle carpet python enclosure. And that means it comes on late in the afternoon, around two or three in the afternoon and turns off early in the morning, like two or three in the morning. I forget exactly what times I picked. So that is to allow a simulation of, imagine the sun warming up a rock surface throughout the day. Maybe in the late afternoon is when it's gonna be at its hottest or throughout the rest of the day. And then as the sun sets, it's of course gonna retain heat and then eventually Early on in the morning, it will no longer have the heat, so it'll be completely dissipated. So that is what that simulates. So at some point in this enclosure between sort of 3 a.m. and 8 a.m., there is no heat. All right, last but not least, the jungle carpet python enclosure. 
And I think this is probably the enclosure that I'm the most proud of as the entire thing, everything you see here, including the stand, is all hand-built by myself. This door is just an acrylic door, and all the walls are glass walls that I made from old windows. So I'm pretty satisfied with this whole thing. And of course, it has a screen top that allows for proper lighting and heating. All right, so many of you are familiar with the series that I did in the summer when I upgraded this enclosure. So obviously I added the screen to accommodate the light. Of course, added the live plants as well. The pothos has been doing fairly well. He's been trampling it a little bit, but that's a pretty tough plant. The umbrella plant has not been doing great. You can see it looks pretty spindly. And that's actually not because he's been trampling it. It's because it had a pest on it. And I didn't even realize it had a pest on it, but basically what happened is... I kept getting these growing tips. These shoots would come out. They'd get to about this size. They'd turn black and they'd die. So it just wouldn't grow. And I was thinking, what is going on with this plant? And then I started seeing a bunch of sap on the leaves, which is typically a sign of a pest. So as I looked closer, I started seeing the, those brown scaly bugs. If you just look up scale bugs or whatever, you'll find it's just a common houseplant pest. And I believe that's what's been hampering the growth of this plant so significantly. So I've been taking Q-tips almost every day with some hydrogen peroxide and just been pulling off the scales when I see them and just wiping the leaves down as best I can to try to keep it clean. And actually, it has been working. I think that's probably the biggest shoot I've seen uh, for the last two or three months. So fingers crossed that is done and the plant can start getting nice and thick. So again, this does have a halogen bulb up at the top of the canopy, and then at the bottom there is a heat mat as well underneath that hide. And just like the Brazilian rainbow boa, the heat pad only comes on in the late afternoon and it turns off early in the morning. And as far as thermostats go for this one, I know there's not a lot of light back here, but I use those little ink bird guys and they actually work really well. I have two of them. Uh, one up there, I know this is terrible quality here, and one here. And one of them actually has a day-night timer on it as well, which is great. So that is a quick run through of all the enclosures in this room and any of the enclosures that do have halogen bulbs, those come on first in the morning It sort of simulates a little bit of a sunrise and they turn off last at night. So the, I love coming in here in the evenings or early mornings when just the halogens are on because it kind of has this cool sunset or sunrise effect. And again, most of the stuff in these enclosures is stuff that I've learned on the podcast. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely go check out the podcast. You'll learn a lot more about reptile care in general. And I know it's definitely helped me in my you know success with these animals. So as we wrap up here, I have one more question from Instagram that I wanted to answer. And that is what is the average cost of upgrading enclosures? And then the second part to that question is what are some tips to save money in your reptile care? Now I would say for the first thing, it really depends. But when we're talking about even lighting and heating, it's going to be hundreds of dollars. My day gecko, that's a couple hundred dollars worth of lighting. Same with my carpet python, a couple hundred dollars. Any of the enclosures that have LED jungle dons as well as UVB and a halogen, it's going to be a couple hundred dollars. And that's what you want to have in mind. You know, when you look at a care sheet for many of these species, you're not going to see that stuff. And it's going to make it, you, you know, assume that reptile care is a cheap thing, but it is not. To care for these animals properly, it is expensive. So if you're upgrading to a larger enclosure, if you're adding new lighting and whatnot, it's going to be several hundred dollars. So that's something that you want to plan for. Now, it's totally worth it. The animal's welfare increases a ton, but it's something that you want to have in mind. And as far as saving money, the best thing you can do when it comes to saving money for reptiles is any of the decor stuff. So, you know, sticks and climbing branches and leaf litter and substrate don't buy that from the pet store. That stuff is ridiculously expensive at the pet store. You buy a stick like this for $40, go outside, get your own sticks. I can show you how to sterilize them. I have a video about that as well. I, can, there, I have a highlight story on Instagram to show you how to clean your leaves or how to take leaf litter and put them in the oven and clean them. And you can also go to greenhouses and buy sphagnum moss and soil there. So you're buying in large quantities. If you're buying something from a reptile store that's like a bag of moss, you're going to pay outrageous prices for it. So that's one great tip. And really the de decor and the substrates and whatnot is a large part of the expense of the enclosure. So if you can do that for free outside or go to a greenhouse and get a cheaper stuff, that's what I would recommend. So my last word of advice, and I've mentioned this before, is if you are new to reptiles, beware that the want to want a new reptile is stronger than the want to have a new reptile. And what that means is you're always going to be wanting more animals. Right before filming this, I was looking up bamboo rat snakes because I really want one now. But at the same time, I know my responsibility is for the animals that I currently own. My job right now is to make the animals' lives that I own better and invest in proper equipment, proper enclosure size, proper lighting, proper, you know, varied diet and whatnot. 
I can't get a new animal until all six of these animals are at that gold level standard and then I can move on. Of course, I'm always going to want more animals, but really try to shift that focus from collecting animals to collecting more for what you have right now, for more for your animals that you currently have in your collection. It is so important that you're not just grabbing animals as quickly as you can and then trying to backtrack and add you know, proper equipment as you can afford it. All right, so one last thing before we wrap up here. As I said at the beginning, I need your help for something. I actually don't need your help, but I want you to participate in an upcoming video. Now, this idea came to me from a commenter a couple weeks ago or last week, and I've kind of made my own variation of this. Now, you have seen my enclosures. You've seen what I've done here, but I want to see what you have done at your home. If you have an enclosure that you're really proud of or something that you've just worked on, send me a picture or a couple of videos or a couple of pictures and a little description of what you've done. Just send it to me on Facebook. If you go to Facebook, Animals at Home, you can find me there or send it to me by email. That's hello at animalsathome.ca. You can contact me either of those ways. Send that to me and eventually I'd like to put a compilation video together of all of the viewers' enclosures. So maybe I'll get like 10 or 12 and I'll review them. I'm not going to review them and roast them or anything. We're just going to take a look at them, see if we can brainstorm new ideas. I I know there's way better enclosures out there than mine and people just don't have, you know, they don't have a YouTube channel, so they're not showing it. So I would love to show off the enclosures that you have at home so it can really help brainstorm and give people new creative ideas for when they want to upgrade their enclosures or make, you know, make something new. Anyway, that is the end of this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. I eventually will do probably another one of these. If you have any questions about any of the animals or equipment and whatnot, definitely put it in the comment box and I will absolutely get back to you.